everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Joseph, and I'm a student in the Biological Anthropology Department. Uh, within that field, I'm particularly interested in functional anatomy, which is the study of how the anatomy of a species influences the way in which it moves and interacts with its environment. So for my project, I decided to study the functional anatomy of one specific human ancestor species, Australopithecus sediba, and I decided to study it using a computer muscul musculoskeletal model of this species. So first thing first, what is Australopithecus sediba? So sediba is a human ancestor species that was discovered in 2008 in what is now South Africa at a cave site called Malapa. It's dated to, about, to be about two million years old. And one of the things that I thought I would do today is actually bring some of the fossils, or rather replicas of the fossils, <laughs> um, and pass them around for you to see so that you can actually hold actually take a look at what parts of her skeleton actually looked like. So one of the things that's really, really interesting about the um, anatomy of Sediba is the fact that she has a mosaic of both chimp and human-like characteristics. So for example, she has the shoulder of pretty much an orangutan, but she also has the pelvis of a modern human. And this suggests, to, this suggests to us that she probably was living in both an arboreal and a terrestrial environment, and that she was exhibiting this sort of dual lifestyle. Now important within this understanding of a dual lifestyle of arboreal and terrestrial um, ecologies is this, is this hypothesis that Sidiba walked with extended leg bipedalism which is similar to the way that we walk, but with a slight variation called hyperpronation. Now, variation in uh, extended leg bipedalism has been proposed many times over the course of human evolution, but this is the first time that a really specific form of variation has been proposed. And we partially wanted to test this. So hyperpronation is um, similar to human gait. So in normal human gait, you generally strike the ground with the heel of your foot and then your foot stays relatively level until your toes push off. Uh, in hyperpronation, you strike the uh, ground with the outside part of your foot, and this causes a torque, which forces you to roll inward, and all of your weight is positioned on the inside of the foot before push off. And this is a really interesting uh, strategy because we think that apes utilize something similar when they're climbing in order to increase their stability. So let's get into the actual methodology of this project. So I started, this is a flow chart of sort of all of the steps that I took to create this model and then analyze the results. So I started with a generic model using a program called OpenSim. This is a program that's primarily used by orthopedic surgeons and physical therapists. Uh, but I used it and adjusted the program to actually create two models. The first one is a model of Australopithecus sediba, and the second model is a model of a very specific human subject. Uh, so in this picture, we can actually see um, the models that I created. So this model over here is our model of Australopithecus sediba, and you'll notice that she's really, really small. She was only about four feet tall. So in order to compensate for that difference in height, um, and in size, we created this model in the middle, which is another model of Sediba, but she's been scaled up to approximate the size of a human, though the proportions are pretty much the same. Uh, and then finally, this is our model of a human subject. Following the creation of these models, we actually went through and analyzed the muscles based on the muscle attachment sites. And we analyzed them through looking at the moment arms. Moment arms are essentially a proxy measurement for for mechanical advantage. So it basically tells you how much force is required to move a limb relative to a joint center. And this tells us something really interesting about habitual postures. So whether or not an animal is more comfortable standing upright with an extended leg, sort of like we stand, or whether or not it was more comfortable standing bent hip and bent knee like a modern ape. After that, we collected human subject motion data and we collected that from a subject walking in both normal gait and hyperpronating gait. And we did this at the Human Adaptation Lab, which is located just down the street at Sargent College. And basically what you do is you go into this lab with your human subject and you put these little white markers on the body 
And then there are these cameras located throughout the room which pick up on the locations of these white markers. And what actually happens then is, let's see if this will work. Oh, it doesn't, that's okay. Um, this is supposed to be a video, but you can actually see um, that where the markers line up in, on her body correspond with their, where they're located on this digital model. So taking this motion data, we were able to plug it into our own Sediba model and actually get this two million year old species to walk again. And unfortunately, it looks like the videos aren't working, um, but later on, if you're interested, I can pull it up and you can see Sediba actually walking in a normal gait and in a hyperpronating gait. It's really cool. So after all of this was done, we went ahead and um, calculated energy expenditure for normal gait and hyperpronating gait. And we did so using this really, really scary equation that's actually designed specifically for measuring energy expenditure in this type of model. So let's get into the actual results. So the first thing we looked at is the, mo the moment arms of all of these muscles. And one of our first findings is that the adductor moment arms were significantly larger in Sediba compared to modern humans, and just slightly smaller than the moment arms of adductors in modern apes. So your adductor muscles are the muscles that are on the inside part of your thigh, and they essentially allow you to bring your leg towards the midline. And we think that this increased moment arm in Sediba has to do with climbing adaptations. So this plays into the, the dual lifestyle hy hypothesis. And you can see on this diagram over here that when a chimp or another ape is climbing up a tree, it's gonna be adducting its leg during the push-off stage in order to propel itself up. So we think that this increase in moment arm is actually very significant. Uh, the other thing that we found in our moment arm analysis is that there is an increase in the moment arms of gluteus maximus, which is the superficial muscle on your butt. Um, and we also found that the maximum moment arms of most muscles occurred in extension rather than flexion. And these things indicate that while Sediba was probably climbing, she wasn't climbing like modern apes. Modern apes f climb in a thing called vertical climbing, and it's sort of like what you see here. Um, we think that she was rather moving in a form called hand-assisted bipedal climbing, and it's sort of exhibited here by this orangutan. And it's similar to the way that you might envision a rock climber climbing. So they would be extending their arms above their head, pulling themselves up, and extending their legs beneath them. In terms of the energy expenditure analysis of the actual terrestrial gait, uh, we looked at whole body energy expenditure during one step, and we compared that to published data on human energy expenditure. So this graph is a little bit complicated, so I'm gonna sort of explain it. So these blue diamonds are human uh, published results from humans of different sizes and their energy expenditure. These two red markers are Sediba hyperpronating and Sediba with normal human gait. And there are two things that you'll notice in this graph. First of all, that within our subjects, for all models, hyperpronating gait and normal gait varied by very little. So the energy expenditure is actually quite comparable between these, these two types of gates. The other thing you'll notice is that energy expenditure in Sediba is relatively high for its mass. We would expect it to be down here and it's up here. And that suggests to us that Sediba wasn't quite as energetically efficient as a modern human. In fact, it suggests that Sediba probably had more difficulty walking long distances and at fast speeds compared to a normal human because humans would then exert less energy per meter than Sediba does. And then our final analysis looked at daily energy expenditure using um, very species specific activity patterns. So basically, um, you'll see here that it says chimpanzee activity pattern and human activity pattern. So that's the amount of time that is allocated to an activity throughout the day. So how much time is spent up in the trees versus down on the ground versus eating. And we combined that with our own locomotion data and um, approximated ranges to calculate how much energy Sediba would be approximated to use throughout the course of a single day. Uh, we, we, we also looked at how much daily energy expenditure is used by a chimp. 
And the comparison between chimps and Sediba is actually really useful because we think that Sediba had a very similar diet to, mom to modern chimps. So if we assume that Sediba was eating around the same amount of calories as a normal chimp is today, we can tell that that would be the limiting factor in how much energy it would be able to expend. So if we look at these bar graphs, you'll see that chimpanzees usually expend around 1,100 kilocalories a day. Sediba in the chimpanzee activity pattern expends probably around 1,300. Uh, that indicates that Sediba probably could have been moving a lot like a chimpanzee in that it was spending comparable amounts of time in a tree versus on the ground. But if you look at human activity pattern or even mixed activity pattern, which is the average of chimpanzee and human activity patterns, uh, those kilocalorie daily energy expenditures are much higher than the chimpanzee. And that indicates that Sediba probably wouldn't have been able to expend the same amount of time on the ground as a human or even something in between a human and a chimp. So it must have had a much more arboreal and chimp-like lifestyle. So just to reiterate some of our conclusions, um, first of all, we found that Sediba probably engaged in a predominantly arboreal lifestyle to conserve energy. We also found that she probably moved using, using hand-assisted bipedalism rather than vertical climbing. Uh, and finally, we also found that she was unable to walk long distances or at fast speeds. Our, our final finding was that, um, throughout the that because of the small variation in energy expenditure that we saw between hyperpronating and normal human gait, um, these small variations probably had a very small effect on overall energy expenditure, which indicates that there must have been other evolutionary pressures at work in order to create these variations rather than simply minimization of energy expenditure. So thank you, and I think we have some time for questions. Yes, we do. So I actually used a specific human subject. So what we did is we went into the human adaptation lab, and when we actually stuck all of these markers on her, um, it actually measures her limb proportions. Um, and then you take those markers and their locations and plug them into the generic model, and it actually scales the generic model to approximate the exact size of our human subject. So it's not really a generic, it's actually specific to a living human. Because I'm just curious why you wouldn't want to do like someone who's taller or shorter or had a different walking gait than the one you're chosen. Um, we wanted somebody that was sort of a baseline human, sort of, like average. yeah, average human. Um, and we wanted somebody who knew enough about uh, gait that she could walk like a normal human to sort of model that as well as walk in a hyperpronating gait to model that as well. Yes, Jeff. Uh, what uh, discoveries, uh, whether it's uh, OSLO itself or maybe a development in technology, would give you a better idea of whether or not or how it is that to be the uh, A medial cuneiform. We, all, we want a medial cuneiform. Um, so yeah, if, if we had, um, we don't have a ton from her foot. Uh, that's one thing that we would really like to have. We sort of have um, the ankle, which I passed around, but um, we would love to have some more foot elements. Um, and we actually, at this point, don't know whether or not she had a grasping big toe. Um, we suspect that she probably didn't because most osteopaths, all osteopaths don't. Um, but we would like to be able to have that information. Um, so if you want to go to South Africa and go find me a mutual cuneiform, I'd be very happy. We have one minute. It's okay, you guys can leave. <laughs> Thank you.